Well, good morning and welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Thank you for joining me. You may have noticed I've got a different coffee cup today. Always a Peanuts fan. Look what was in my Christmas stocking this year. <laughs> well, you may see this one a little more often. Uh, great, great commentary from Charles Schultz, Peanuts, always uh, touching on the reality of childhood, but usually bringing in the good Christian thoughts in regard to that. We're in Psalm 75 today, Psalm 75, one that is filled with meaning and really uh, comes on the heels of Psalm 74, the psalm that asks why when nothing but destruction could be seen across the land. And uh, Psalm 75 and 76 kind of go with that. In fact, I'd like to read an introduction to this before we read Psalm 75 today so you'll get a picture of the setting before we read its, its words and its ten short verses. If you can imagine going back to the time in which the Assyrians were invading. They were coming to Judah and they were going to encamp around Jerusalem, besiege it, and once again uh, make the Jews pay and become subservient to them. Dr. John Phillips shares it this way. He said, One day the horrified Jews of Jerusalem looked out over the battlements of their city and they saw the dreaded cohorts of Assyria drawn up before their gates. These dreaded storm troops and siege troops uh, had been all over the Middle East. Okay, You could see them as, as far as the eye could see. It's all you could see are these troops. They had marched at will over all the Middle East, leaving behind smoking ruins, flayed and impaled human beings who screamed out their last hours in indescribable anguish. Mounds of corpses demoralized survivors, and they were, as an army, invincible. Now they were encamped outside Jerusalem. Their spokesman and propaganda chief had done his best to further demoralize king, garrison, and citizens. His contemptuous letter had been handed to Hezekiah, who in turn had read it to the Lord. The sun set on the sight. The paralyzed Jews crept to their beds in dread of what the morrow might bring. We could uh, go on with some details about that, but let your imagination do the work. The sun arose on the morning shortly thereafter, and the Jews crept back to the walls. Now the tents were still there. The Assyrian banners were still flapping in the breeze, but what was this? Vultures were now assembling and circling the camp. There was a dreadful stillness yonder, the stillness of death. Then the truth dawned. The Assyrians were dead. God had read the letter, and he had replied to it by return post. In the thrill of it all, Psalm 75 was written, and also Psalm 76. It seems to be reply to Psalm 74, where the psalmist asked why, but the occasion of Psalm 74 uh, Phillips believes was quite different, written by probably a captive in Babylon. But it is right and proper that the two Psalms should be placed shoulder to shoulder in the hymn book, one with the question, the other with the answer. It's also quite evident that uh, there's some prophetic messages, maybe even down through the centuries, that uh, these Psalms carry with them. One more commentary on it before we actually read it, and then your mind will really be spinning as we look at these words. But rabbinic scholars commenting on Psalm 75 uh, give reference to the end of the exile when Israel will be regathered, the Jewish people will be regathered, and in their mind, Messiah will come, not the second coming as we expect because we know Jesus Christ is the fulfilled Messiah of the Jews. But listen to this. Rabbinic scholars commenting on Psalm 75 wrote that, quote, Israel's anguish will intensify as the end of the exile draws near. And at that time, calamities will befall Israel in rapid succession. The world will be engulfed in the colossal conflict of Gog and Magog. For some, they believed that that actually started around the year 1975. As the exile is now beginning to draw to a close, Israel has been established, Jerusalem is theirs, and the wars beginning with the Yom Kippur War and now the wars of almost constant terrorism come down upon Israel trying to destroy her before Messiah comes. 
And so we enter a period of time which would probably be one jubilee, one 50-year period of time, which is the last before the coming of the long-anticipated Messiah. So interesting thoughts as to the way uh, different folks, especially how the Jews, look at this particular psalm. But understanding that it is written probably firsthand in reference to the great victory that took place when God stepped in and saved Hezekiah's kingdom from the Assyrians. We read these words, beginning in verse 1. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks, for your name is near. Men tell of your wonderful deeds. You say, I chose the appointed time. It is I who judge uprightly. When the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. To the arrogant I say, boast no more. To the wicked, do not lift up your horns. Now, these horns are not in reference to those you might play as a musical instrument, okay? These are horns instead of warfare. It's talking about horns as you would think in terms of those on the front of an animal that we would use to attack. And so when he says, do not lift up your horns, do not lift up your military weapons against me. Verse 5, do not lift your horns against heaven. Do not speak with outstretched neck. Verse 6, no one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt a man, but it is God who judges. He brings one down, he exalts another. And in the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out, and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. As for me, I will declare this forever. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob. I will cut off the horns of all the wicked, but the horns of the righteous will be lifted up. And again, we see four times the word horns in this psalm, where God is saying, don't bring your weapons of warfare against my people. Do not come and attack them, because I will cut off the horns of the wicked. Now, don't we wish we could say we see that happening all the time? But no, for God in his purposes has to allow wicked to exist for a little while. But we all look forward to the day in which Psalm 75 is completely fulfilled, and he has cut off the horns of the wicked, and the horns of the righteous are lifted up. So this psalm in itself not only is a celebration of what happened in the day of Hezekiah, but it's looking forward to a day in which God will in his finality judge all and all will be made right. Well, listen, uh, it's, it's a solemn kind of a psalm because it's a celebration of victory on the other side of what could have been a terrible defeat. Many times the darkest hour is just before dawn. It seems like things are going so sour and so bad that all might collapse, it all might fall until God steps in. If you're in one of those situations today, even personally, maybe it seems like I feel a little more like Psalm 74. I'm asking why, God, aren't you around? Why aren't you with me? It seems like things are falling apart. Trust in the one who will lift up and protect you today. The one who will say, hey, I'm for you. Be on my side, the right side, and eventually I will lift you up. Well, God bless you. Thank you for joining me today on Wake Up in the Word. Let's do this again tomorrow. We're getting close to a new year, and uh, we're going to keep plodding through the Psalms and pick up these wonderful messages one by one. God bless you. We'll see you again tomorrow on Wake Up in the Word.